we bring people to this great campus and this great facility, but also online through our publications and thought-provoking journals, we're able to carry the messages around principled leadership and what President Bush's example means to all of us. Having the Bush Center here is really the crown jewel of the campus. Everyone associated with SMU is extremely proud of it. The value of the George W. Bush Presidential Center to Dallas and North Texas, outside the state of Texas, is truly incalculable. With SMU, we've hosted conversations with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and with business leaders like Jeff Bezos. Our policy programs benefit from the minds and interests of SMU faculty and students. My hope is that the Bush Center will always serve as a place where timeless principles are celebrated, protected, and promoted. We just want to make sure the next 10 years are as great as the beginning years of what we're doing here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Managing Director of the Bush Institute SMU Economic Growth Initiative, Matthew Rooney. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another sold-out program in our series, Engage at the Bush Center, presented by Highland Capital Management. I want to thank everyone for being here with us this evening, and, and welcome also those who are following online on our live stream coverage. I'd like to extend a special welcome to Mike Meese, a member of the board and a good friend of the institution. Mike, it's a pleasure to see you. Welcome. And also a special welcome to our 19 We Lead Scholars. These are women leaders that we've come in contact with throughout Afghanistan, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, and Tunisia. And they're here in Dallas for the first module of a special leadership training program uh, that the Bush Institute is carrying out, all with the, object with the objective of increasing economic opportunity in their communities. Thank you for being here, ladies. The Bush Institute is honored to play a small role in your success. I also want to welcome students and faculty from the SMU Department of Economics. Their presence here tonight flows from the formal partnership that we entered into with SMU, particularly the Department of Economics, earlier this year that merges the Bush Institute's action orientation, our convening power, and our high-profile high platform with SMU's research and academic excellence. We start in that partnership from a shared conviction that human economic freedom is the key to promoting broadly-based prosperity, and that American leadership in the global economy is beneficial to the United States and to our partners. Together, we intend to advance policies that promote economic growth and strengthen our global competitiveness. We've chosen as areas of policy focus, first, globalization and trade, with a focus on North America and our close trading partners in Central America, growth-oriented domestic economic policy framework, immigration reform, and the importance of vitally thriving cities and regions for the growth of our national economy. And of course, all of these themes touch on innovation in one sense or another. Globalization tends to drive and be driven by innovation. A growth-oriented domestic economic policy has to address how the economy will promote innovation. Innovation drives and is driven by immigration, and, and innovation drives the economic vitality of our growing urban regions. With this in mind, we brought together a group of some of the leading thought thinkers on some interesting and important innovative topics for tonight's discussion, where we're going to touch on cri cryptocurrencies, artificial intelligence, and other disruptive technologies. We're so grateful to our friends at Highland Capital Management for endowing the Engage series. Their commitment to this series of engagements with the community enables the Bush Center to continue to bring in globally recognized experts like the ones we have with us tonight to help us better understand the most challenging issues of our time. And tonight's program is a particular treat because it is the first in what is to become an annual series of Highland Capital lectures. With that, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage the co-founder and chief investment officer of Highland Capital Management, Mark Okada.
Thank you, Matt. And we're excited to welcome you to the first annual Highland Capital Lecture, part of the Engage series. Uh, and the fact that this event is sold out is a testament to the Bush Center and the type of audience it reaches. Um, and this is not an easy topic. You know, you're, you all didn't come here to just sit around and be entertained. Uh, otherwise, you, you wouldn't come to something on, on cryptocurrencies and, and AI. Um, you're here to be challenged, right? Uh, to learn some new things about uh, disruptive technologies in the future. And these are very important issues. Either that or you've realized that the Mavs are lame and you don't want to go to the game tonight. <laughs> Had to say that as a Laker fan. Anyways. So Highland's been a long time supporter of the Bush Center um, because we recognize that as, as an asset, what an asset this kind of institution is to our, our, our ecosystem here in Dallas. It's one of the few organizations of its kind in our city that has a real global reach, uh, while at the same time staying true to its Texas roots, just like its namesake. Um, and over the last years, we've seen the Bush Center use this position to do important work on a local, national, and global scale. A work that promotes our economy, serves our veterans, and helps develop our future leaders in the US and around the world. So we've since doubled down on our, our commitment to the Bush Center and recently became the presenting sponsor of their Engage program, which includes events like tonight. And with their Engage initiatives, the Bush Center brings experts uh, and thought leaders from all different fields to Dallas to tackle some of the biggest issues, present and future. And they bring these discussions to the community, attracting a captive audience like the one here tonight who amplify these ideas. So we want to thank the Bush Center for the work they're doing here and for the support of the people like you who understand its importance. And with that, we're thrilled to bring you a panel of true experts. So in a few minutes, coming to the stage will be Dr. Barry Eichengreen. Uh, he's a professor of political science from uh, the economics at the University of, of California, Berkeley, and he writes a, a monthly column for the Project Syndicate. And uh, the good news is that he's written a new book um, called The Populist Temptation, Economic Grievance, and the Political Reaction in the Modern Era. And he's signed those, and they will be available for purchase uh, after the program. Also with us, you, you couldn't talk about uh, cryptocurrencies without having uh, your local Fed president. So we're, we're very pleased to have Rob Kaplan. And since 2015, he's been the president and the CEO of the Dallas Fed. Before that, Rob was a professor and senior associate uh, dean at, at the Harvard Business School. And before that, he spent two years, um, uh, to over two decades with Goldman Sachs. He certainly understands money. And, and our third panelist is Tur de Meester. Uh, uh, besides having a very difficult last name to, to pronounce, um, he's also an economist and a long-time uh, Bitcoin investor and the founder of Adamant Capital, uh, a Bitcoin alpha fund. So we had to have someone young um, who can, could can tell us what's going on on the ground. But he's been an outspoken uh, proponent of Bitcoin and the first uh, recommended as an investment in 2012 when the price was $5. Um, today, the price is over $6,400, and, and uh, I'm told that he has uh, over 178,000 Twitter followers, which is about 100 times more than I have. So, and finally, our, our moderator is a good friend and a person well known to this audience, uh, the CEO of the Bush Center, Ken Hurst. So, uh, thanks to all for being here. Um, before Ken brings the panel out, as with every good lecture, we're going to start with a, a short tutorial video on the topic of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. So thanks. Bitcoin lets people exchange money electronically as easily as sending an email or text. To send money, you use what's called a wallet app to type in an amount, enter or scan a recipient's account number, and hit send. The recipient will then see the money pop up in their account. So how does this work? At a basic level, Bitcoin is just a ledger with account numbers and balances. When Bob sends Carol five Bitcoins, his balance goes down by five and Carol's up by five. There's no gold or government issued money backing these numbers, just people's belief that the numbers are worth something and a system that prevents unfair changes. Part of the system makes sure no one can spend money from someone else's account. 
Every time you hit send, your wallet app sends a message to the Bitcoin network describing how the ledger should change, including the sender's and recipient's account numbers and amount to transfer. So what's to prevent a thief from creating a message transferring money from someone else's account? Bitcoin requires a kind of signature on each message to prove that it was created by the true account owner. The signature serves the same purpose as a handwritten signature on a paper check, but it's based on math rather than handwriting. The math comes from the world of cryptography, which is normally used to hide secret messages, but in Bitcoin has been repurposed to prove ownership. Each Bitcoin account number has an associated key that only the true account owner knows and is used to create signatures by encrypting transaction messages. Others test the signature by trying to decrypt it. If successful, they know the signature was created by the true account owner. In addition to not relying on handwriting analysis, these math-based signatures can't be copied and reused on other transactions, since the signatures are unique to each transaction. So these signatures keep unauthorized transactions from changing the ledger, but who exactly is checking the signatures and, overall, maintaining the ledger? Surprisingly, anyone who wants to. One of the main goals of Bitcoin is to provide a decentralized system, meaning no single company or government can control it. Every time someone sends money, a transaction message is passed around to all the people who want to help maintain the ledger who I'll call maintainers. Each maintainer keeps a personal copy of the ledger and updates it whenever they receive a new transaction with a valid signature. With ledgers spread all over the world, traffic delays and occasionally fraud can lead to differences in those ledgers. So how does the world decide which version to use? Like in other democratic systems, there's a vote, but it's a bit different than a typical ballot system. Maintainers vote by trying to solve a special puzzle based on their version of the ledger. The first person to solve a puzzle announces their solution, and everyone updates to that version. So the vote turns out to be a kind of mathematical race, but it's designed to favor the majority's version. This is because the more people there are working on a particular version, the faster it will be solved. Because new transactions are constantly being generated, this voting process repeats over and over again so maintainers can continually agree about new transactions. So why math problems instead of, say, emailing in votes to decide on a ledger? Without a central authority to register voters, it would be hard to enforce one vote per person. A single person could create multiple accounts to vote more than once, or even millions of times. The math problems prevent this by making each vote have a cost in computers and electricity. This means outvoting or outsolving the majority to take over the ledger would effectively require outspending the majority, an unlikely event. So the math enables a fair vote in a decentralized system. Two more important details about how it does this. To prevent someone from pre-solving a puzzle to win the race, each puzzle builds on previous answers, and the winner is not just the most recent solution, but the ledger version with the most total solutions. The puzzles are also extraordinarily special in that there are no tricks to solving them faster, other than by buying more computers and electricity. It's this property that underlies the entire system and gives people assurance that the solutions are truly from the majority and not a clever attacker. A final note about how money is created. Every time a puzzle is solved, a small award is added to the solver's balance, effectively creating money out of thin air. This award acts as an incentive for people to help maintain the ledger and is in addition to small fees senders attach to transactions. Because maintainers acquire newly created money through computation, they are typically called miners, but their main purpose is really to manage the ledger, not to create money. The voting system simply provides a convenient way to randomly distribute money into the world, and in fact, after 2140, no more money will be created. In summary, Bitcoin is an electronic currency that's based on a collaboratively maintained ledger. People transfer money by sending messages to maintainers describing where and how much money should move. Maintainers make sure that the messages are from the true account owners by checking digital signatures. And finally, the maintainers reach consensus with each other through a math-based voting process. Okay, so now that we all know what we're talking about, <laughs> the, uh, the, the summary of this, if I could, is that um, this concept, this Bitcoin, is a network that is peer-to-peer, -peer, um, that works without an intermediary, is politically neutral, it's not subject to competing monetary policies, it has privacy because encryption, and there's a finite supply of 21 million, so there's no printing press. Um, 
so I've done a lot of work on this. I, I did about five years ago buy Bitcoin at $200 and sold it at $700, thought I was a genius. <laughs> um, it promptly went to, not promptly, about two years later went to 16,000, now it's back down to 6,000. Not as smart as I thought it was, um, but still it piqued my interest. And when I've done more work on this, what's really interesting about this is this divergence of opinion around its utility and its future. We have people who say it's going to be worth $100,000 a coin or a $1 million a coin. Um, Charlie Munger says it's worthless artificial gold. Mm. Um, what's also interesting is many of the inventors of the code and the users of these networks are young, were born or have origins in Eastern Europe, mm. uh, many who have in their families have emigrated to Canada, and, and it's sort of this... Um, this community of people who come from places that are skeptical, where, where the people are skeptical of their central authorities, they don't trust their monetary or they don't have good monetary authorities. They've had periods of hyperinflation or, or valueless currencies. And so this, this starvation for trying to find a way to end around the system that they don't necessarily trust. And the last thing they want to do is turn over all of the, their trust to the now technological, technology oligarchs of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Tencent, um, Baidu, Alibaba, et cetera. So let me start with Tour, because you're the proponent here. Is at its core Bitcoin simply a proxy battle between trust around central monetary and government authorities and distrust and the community that distrusts it trying to do an end around? I think you got that right. Like one of the mottos that has emerged from, uh, from this community is um, don't trust, verify. And people like to contrast that with what's written on the dollar bill, which is, you know, in God we trust. Uh, or, I mean, you know, often it's, it's clear that you have to trust in, in a committee who will come to a decision and, and, and be responsible. Um, and so that is what, uh, what Bitcoin challenges. It, 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 it basically poses that it is possible to have something like a digital gold that has the benefits of the scarcity of gold but at the same time combines it with um, the benefits that come with digital transactions. And, uh, and it's very appealing to have something that is politically neutral. Um, like, I mean, I think it's, it's a pretty known problem in, in the traditional monetary sphere, the, the Triffin uh, dilemma of like having this uh, tug of war between political interests on the one hand, on the, on the other hand, that mandate to create a currency that can be used globally. Um, and so I think Bitcoin challenges that at its core, and especially for, like you said, people who, uh, I discovered Bitcoin in 2011 in, um, in Argentina, and, and you know, my friends down there, they had no means of purchasing Bitcoin, even though there were already some exchanges. Um, because of the capital controls, they just were not able to buy it, but they were able to mine it in their own house, and, and there was a, some local trade that happened with it. Um, and, uh, and of course, even up, up until today, there's 50 billion uh, paper dollars circulating in, in uh, the country of Argentina, and virtually all uh, real estate transactions still happen with uh, a suitcase of cash. You know? And so those kind of problems uh, really are addressed uh, with Bitcoin, but, but to me, the core value proposition is not so much the payment side of things. It's really about um, having this scarcity, right? The, this predictable financial policy that is embedded in a protocol and um, that basically allows you, like, for example, me or uh, I don't want to speak for like my generation, quote unquote, but, but um, you know, people of my age, when you go to, for example, a life insurance broker and you talk about, well, you know, thinking about maybe a, $250,000 policy or half a million dollar policy, most of my generation will trust that those dollars will be there or whatever your local currency is when they need to be paid out to the family. But what we don't know is what is going to be the value of those, you know, I, I don't want to say tokens, but of those monetary units when that happens. Right. And so having an alternative where you can put some of your personal trust in a system that is um, mathematically designed to convert energy into financial um, stability, uh, that is appealing. Okay. So, Barry, do you mm. agree that, that, that that's really at this core, or do you think there's something else going on? I think I'm closer to Charlie Munger's age than I am to Tours. <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I don't know what politically neutral <clears throat> means in this context. The Federal Reserve, and Rob can speak to this better than I can, is politically independent 
and it has a mandate to um, pursue uh, high employment and price stability. That sounds pretty politically neutral to me. Uh, at its core, we're talking about a token that is supposed to provide monetary services, right? Substitute for money. And the first thing we learn in, about money in economics is unit of account, means of payment, store of value. Well, uh, cryptocurrencies don't provide any of those services in reliable fashion. Unit of account, nobody quotes, is going to quote prices at the grocery store in units of Bitcoin, which are highly volatile. Um, it's risky to hold all, all, all your savings in, in, in cryptocurrencies, again, because of the price volatility. And this is an incredibly uh, retrograde, uh, energy intensive, expensive way of making payments. So um, at, at risk uh, of maybe not making some friends tonight, I, I, you know, I think that um, cryptocurrencies are, are useful if you have a deep distrust of government, if you want to evade government scrutiny of your financial transactions. So uh, for money launderers, tax evaders, okay. terrorist financiers, <laughs> So it, it so, has utility. So, um, Rob, there are there are two billion people in this world who are unbanked, who don't have the luxury that we have, as Barry said, of having a credible um, central monetary authority. There are people in Africa who are using phone minutes as currency because they can prepay their cell phone, and that is a value. So, if I give you my prepaid cell in exchange for your chicken, that works as a unit of exchange. Um, that that people can agree on as organized barter. Is the, is, there are 190 plus countries, there's 100 currencies in this, in this world. Is there room for another currency and it just, be, and it just happens to be digital? So uh, maybe, but, but this, so this got started, rates were extremely low, they're basically zero. Uh, people, a lot of fear about what's the value of, uh, of currencies. So as a store of value, like when you bought it, it's gone up a lot. It's not, even though it's down about two thirds over the last year, uh, it's been a good store of value. What holds it You're back- You're gonna remind me that I sold it at 700? That's all right. Uh, <laughs> you might still be glad you sold it at 700 before this is over. Uh, where, it's, where it hasn't met expectations is as a transaction currency right. because it flunks a number of the tests. The most important thing is it's not, it's not stable. Uh, and as Barry mentioned, the reason it's been used by some is it's got one feature, uh, which is anonymity. In other words, if you don't want people to know who you are and what you're transacting. The, the one, so it's, it's, not, it's not caught on in terms of adoption by merchants or consumers yet because of the volatility. But the one thing that has been, is promising out of it uh, is the blockchain technology and distributed ledgers, I think has a lot of applicability beyond just cryptocurrency, and that's one of the things that's been possible. Right, okay, so we're gonna come back to that, but let me ask you a follow up, Rob, is that just because you don't like it, and there are lots of people using it, if there is a substantial amount of, of monetary transactions that take place kind of off the grid on this ledger, sure. um, for whether they're nefarious or not, um, how does a central bank conduct monetary and how does the government conduct tax policy if 10% of its transactions are happening kind of, you know, in a, you, what you would call a gray market? And, it, and it's not that I either like it or dislike it. We watch it very, very carefully at okay. the Fed because we, we are very active in the payment system. To your point, if this ever became ubiquitous, then there'd have to be new regulation. And because by definition, a lot of the things we do, collecting taxes on transactions, a lot of other things, depends on being able to keep track of transactions. And so this, this would create some real problems for regulatory authorities, taxing authorities, you name it. But it's, it's not been adopted enough for most countries to need to deal with that right. yet. So now in China, um, and maybe Tor, you can comment on this. So it, is the genie out of the bottle? In China today, peer-to-peer -to -peer transactions with no central friction, there's 870 million users of Alipay, which is Alibaba's uh, electronic uh, payment system, a third of whom are outside of China. Um, and in, in this last summer, they launched Gcash, which is a, which is a blockchain version of their currency. Um, and, it's, and they can now transact money internationally outside the, outside the view of the US or the Chinese authorities. Is that, how would you regulate that and is the genie out of the bottle? 
Well, I'd love to comment, but can I also comment sure. on the criticisms that I've heard uh, uh, earlier? Please. Thanks. You're um, the youngest one at the panel, so you yeah, have to. If you don't mind, do I, I'd like to like, uh, <laughs> like offer just a small response. So, so and, and, and the criticism that I, I think, you know, it's valid to think about these things. Like, for example, the volatility is, is often brought up, and, uh, and, and, you know, these four criteria that money ought to abide by, I think uh, there's a nuance there. Uh, if you If you consider Bitcoin as potentially a startup currency where the end goal is maybe to have this unit of account idea. Um, and I think, you know, Stanley Jevons and, and other economists have pointed out that, you know, the monetization of gold didn't go from zero to unit of account. It went through phases. First it was a collectible, then it became a store of value, then it became a medium of, of exchange, and eventually you had that unit of, and so I, I feel like Bitcoin is nine years old. Give it some slack in terms of, you know, we, we're past the collectible stage. It's no longer just a curiosity. At least, you know, maybe 10 million or more people consider it a store of value of some sorts. And so, you know, down the road, we'll get to this medium of exchange. That, that's, that's a response there. Uh, it, too expensive to make payments, that's absolutely valid. Like, scaling Bitcoin is, is a huge challenge. Basically, blockchains, they're the worst databases imaginable. They store everything forever. So obviously, to have everything on this first layer, it, it, it doesn't scale at all. So you need to come up with uh, technology that links into that first layer and that can build upon it, and that takes time. And now we have the Lightning Network and Bitcoin. There's the liquid sidechain that came out. So we are working on scaling that. And then, of course, the, 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 uh, the criticism that it's used for you know, illicit purposes, and that same criticism was uh, launched at, at, at the internet in the early days where it was you know, for pornography and gambling and nothing else. Um, I think that it's already being disproven by the fact that uh, Wall Street and, and other large institutions are working hard on the financialization of Bitcoin, right? right. We, are, we do have Bitcoin futures. We are going to have in a, in a few years probably a Bitcoin ETF. So like, you know, very traditional financial product pro where you get exposure to the scarcity in a, in a very strict regulatory framework. And Fidelity yeah. just announced that, that you can that they're going to set up an, a, a system by which you can custody um, your your fidelity exactly right. there's back there's yeah. there's uh, and so to right. so uh, to to mm -hmm. just to intercede um, just so people appreciate a a, a block a, a Bitcoin if you were to do transactions it the system because of the way it has to be validated by the crowd essentially and there's eight thousand nodes of people out there who will validate by a majority vote um, with, after they solve this puzzle can do about five transactions per second. To put that in perspective, Visa processes 25,000 transactions per second. So Bitcoin has a long way to go before you can scale it on the current technology. Well, but back, but I, I think the metaphor, to, uh, to, if you want to compare it to something, the blockchain, compared to the London bullion market, right? Compared to, sorry, compared to the LBMA, where there's wholesale settlement of gold transactions, and then of course the ETF volumes of gold are way higher. Right. So Bitcoin Lightning can uh, process millions of transactions right. per second, and okay. then it gets settled on the on the chain. So back to the, back, no, back to the question around: Is the genie out of the bottle with what with what I talked about, Alipay? and then we'll come to Barry. Mm. Yeah, and so um, I think absolutely when you think about generations, uh, as far as I understand, the, the millennial generation is the largest in terms of absolute numbers. I think in the U.S. it's like 96 million people. Uh, by 2029, the, the, um, the disposable income of, of the millennial generation will supersede uh, the baby boomers. So I think that... Uh, and, and, and this is absolutely a generation that grew up with things like BitTorrent, where you know you are able to download information from all around the internet, and it's not a company; it's just a, a, some software that you run on your computer. People who grew up with open source software, every mobile phone has has Linux as its root. So, so th these things come a lot more natural. So, absolutely, I think uh, young people are they will have bitcoins on their phone. I suspect that baby boomers they will have bitcoin in their retirement account. They, they sometimes won't even know that they have financial exposure to it. Okay. So, Barry, do you think that the genie's out of the bottle? If the genie's out of the bottle, I think it can still go back in. Okay. I hope the, and how, do, how does I that hope the millennial, millennial generation is smart enough not to put uh, um, all their eggs in one bottle. Um, I want to push back in addition uh, against what you said about peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending and borrowing and, and cryptocurrencies as somehow being useful for this. Uh, financial inclusion is a big problem in Africa. Cell phones are a big part of the solution. People don't have to wait on fixed line networks to communicate with their bank, which is the reliable, fraud-resistant uh, manner of doing financial 
transactions. You mentioned Visa in passing. Visa provides credit lines, fraud detection services, uh, and so forth. There are good reasons why in the real world we have intermediaries. I don't think they're going anywhere. Good. And Rob, uh, with a crypto asset, unlike a $10 bill or a $100 bill, if you and I transact with a $100 bill, we don't know if that $100 bill five transactions ago was exchanged between a terrorist and a drug dealer. And then it came and got laundered, et cetera, and now I transact with a $100 bill. With the blockchain and the crypto ledger, um, you, can f you can see the history of every transaction. Doesn't it have some value? Yeah. I think it does. So our, our, the, what, our role at the Fed, and I sit on a four-person committee, as you know, that oversees payments in the United States, and we're a big payments operator. We're watching this very, very carefully. The only thing I'd caution, again, the technology associated with it, I think in some ways is more exciting than the, than the currency itself. I think blockchain is being used for other purposes. And I'd say in the payment space, this is not the most exciting or even innovative okay. thing I see going on. So I just think it's worth putting it in context. Okay, um, we're gonna get to that last question before we go to the blockchain in general. Um, if um, the, this, I'm gonna get you to, out of your comfort zone here. Um, given, That's good. Given the uh, inevitable uh, trajectory that the U.S. Uh, fiscal situation mm -hmm. uh, is, is on, yeah. um, and there's likely a point at which the U.S. is no longer a triple A credit, and in bear with me. In that case, um, where the U where where people don't necessarily trust the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency, would you rather have a secure crypt, encrypted uh, uh, currency um, trading uh, like Bitcoin or a crypto asset, rather than the RMB? and the Bank of China controlling the currencies around the world? So as you know, I talk a lot about this risk as one of the risks I'm worried about. I think in that scenario where the U.S. actually has to moderate its debt growth and the world doesn't stop buying dollars, they just wait, go to market weight, we got a lot bigger issues than whether we use, you know, whether we use cryptocurrencies or not. And I'm very worried. And so my my comment is, I'd rather answer it this way. I think my advice would be let's let's moderate our debt growth while the U.S. is still the reserve currency. We still have a little time before, uh, maybe an extended period of time, but I don't think we should take it for granted. Okay. And so I'll just remind you of the number: 870 million people are now transacting away from a central authority. Um, using Alipay, using one company's database yeah. with us. With, that's going to heavily. Grow, that's going right? to. Our view grow. is, by the way, that's going to explode. Right. Uh, the only thing I know for sure about the payment system, and Alipay is a good example, is we, we won't be able to predict how it's going to change. These 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 methodologies that, in fairness, started with Bitcoin and now proliferate. They're, they're going to grow dramatically, good. and a lot of people are in financial institutions are going to be disintermediated. Okay. Do you want to weigh in or do you want to go what, to What makes you think cryptocurrencies are secure? I'm sorry? What makes you think cryptocurrencies are secure? Um, only, yeah, that's a good question. Ma is Mount how secure Gox. is the encryption? Can you say Mt. Gox? They get hacked. Where the exchange, they get, the exchange they get stolen. Can I comment on that? Yeah, I think, so I think that you, you're absolutely right that intermediaries will not go away. We will have you know, banks of some sorts, custodians. Uh, the whole world is never going to have all their assets on their phone. That is just uh, ridiculous. Uh, division of labor has its, its value. Um, and, 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 but that doesn't mean that Bitcoin, you know, to say that a Bitcoin bank went bust uh, a couple years ago and, and there's continuous hacks happening doesn't mean that Bitcoin, the protocol, is, is flawed. Bitcoin has an uptime of 99.99%, uh, which is higher than uh, most other financial networks. And so this is just a growth problem. It's just, a, you know, in, in the 1800s, there were lots of uh, banks that uh, got robbed um, and, and, and there were issues with insurance of deposits and things like that. And so Bitcoin is facing um, similar issues. I don't think it's, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's anything more than, than um, growth crap. Okay, and so that, that's a perfect segue because I think that the comment, the, the concept of security comes from the distributed nature that rather than all of your information being stored on, say, the JP Morgan uh, servers, um, there are servers all over the world that have that information. So if one gets hacked, then they, it's a long, it takes, it takes, uh, 
it, it won't catch on and the system will correct itself. Let's shift gears because the, the Bitcoin is kind of a, a first application, a peer-to-peer -peer currency application of what was built on top of this concept of the blockchain and this distributed ledger. And I don't wanna have the audience glaze over here because just because I can't write the code that actually makes email work doesn't mean I don't know how to use email. So everybody here can understand this, but to really make it simple, we have a two minute video. <laughs> when you vote, have you ever wondered whether your ballot is actually counted? If you meet someone online, how do you know they're who they say they are? When you buy coffee that's labeled Fairtrade, what makes you so certain of its origin? To be sure, really sure, about any of those questions, you'd need a system where records could be stored, facts could be verified by anyone, and security is guaranteed. That way, no one could cheat the system by editing records, because everyone using the system would be watching. Systems like this are on the horizon, and the software that powers them is called a blockchain. Blockchains store information across a network of personal computers, making them not just decentralized, but distributed. This means no central company or person owns the system, yet everyone can use it and help run it. This is important because it means it's difficult for any one person to take down the network or corrupt it. The people who run the system use their computer to hold bundles of records submitted by others, known as blocks, in a chronological chain. The blockchain uses a form of math called cryptography to ensure that records can't be counterfeited or changed by anyone else. You've probably heard of the blockchain's first killer app, a form of digital cash called Bitcoin that you can send to anyone, even a complete stranger. Bitcoin is different from credit cards, PayPal, or other ways to send money because there isn't a bank or financial middleman involved. Instead, people from all over the world help move the digital money by validating others' Bitcoin transactions with their personal computers, earning a small fee in the process. Bitcoin uses the blockchain by tracking records of ownership over this digital cash, so only one person can be the owner at a time and the cash can't be spent twice, like counterfeit money in the physical world can. But Bitcoin is just the beginning for blockchains. In the future, blockchains that manage and verify online data could enable us to launch companies that are entirely run by algorithms, making self-driving cars safer, help us protect our online identities, and even track the billions of devices on the Internet of Things. These innovations will change our lives forever, and it's all just beginning. Okay, so we're going to really nerd out here on blockchain for a minute, because I think that this is a... Um, something that Steve Wozniak has said, that the blockchain is the next IT revolution that, that uh, is about to happen, and that Ethereum, um, which is a, a second derivation of the blockchain, could be more influential than Apple. So um, thinking about disruptive networks, um, and any network that, is cent that has a central um, authority is a place at that pinch point, whether it be a stock exchange, you can collect a toll, um, at that pinch point. And a stock exchange would be a, a simple, a securities clearing. But there are, other, there are other central networks. The DMV is a central network. Um, the title registry for real property is a central network. Um, passports are a central network. Um, even voting is a, cent you go to a central place and, and vote. Uh, title insurance, money transfers, et cetera. So the blockchain has, has opened up the question about is there a way to disintermediate this the way Uber through software disintermediated the regulated taxi business. You had to get a medallion from a central authority to be a taxi company. And through software and owning zero cars, Uber has been able to disrupt that. So are we about to see a central, a disruption, Rob, of these central registries? Probably. The Based on, listen, we just, we just did a, um a deep dive with the whole uh, payments industry on uh, on on this subject, and yeah, I think so. The only thing the only thing I concluded out of this is the applicability of blockchain. I will never be able to predict what it's going to be, but my guess is when we look back uh, 20 years from now, uh, it's going to involve it's going to be used in a whole range of industries that we're not even imagining, and you'll have companies run by algorithm. You'll have uh, and the reason that this is so appealing is it's going to be much less expensive and it may in fact be more defensible from cyber attacks, 
and other things that almost everybody in this room, if you run a company or a foundation right. or you name it, is trying to defend against. Right. It could be very powerful. Like Equifax, you know, is a central place and it got hacked with everybody's credit uh, yeah. reports on it. Um, Tour, what do you see the blockchain evolving to? Yeah, um, maybe I can play the role of the skeptic a little more here. <laughs> um, because, um, you know, the thing, like I said earlier, like, the problem is, is that if you have a system where you promote a lot of redundancy, that, that means a lot of money, right? That costs a lot of money. And, uh, and, and to get effective redundancy, where it's not just, you know, you spin up 400 instances on, on AWS, which is not really distribution. So, so that's one issue. So as an investor, I'm struggling to see value right now. It doesn't mean that nothing's going to happen down the road. Um, but I, I think what happened in the past year, like, it's just... Um, it's kind of horrifying in the sense that I think it's an enormous lemon market where we're seeing lots of um, kind of, you know, people sense that there may be something there and they're trying to invest. But I think it could be something like video streaming in 1999 where, where it was, it's a great idea, great vision, but it just takes a lot of work. And, and, and uh, just like we see this with a lot of technological innovations is that in the early years there's lots of explosions and lots of things that go wrong. And so I, I you know, I kind of tremble thinking about the kind of things that people are talking about doing with smart contracts today. Uh, because really, I mean, uh, the, this is the equivalent of the code that people are producing here. And I am talking about maybe like the smart contracts that we've seen on Ethereum, et cetera. Is kind of, you're kind of doing something of the financial, the financial equivalent of like building a nuclear power plant. Like you're building something that could really explode in your face. And so I think that we need a lot of testing and we need a solid basis, first of all. And I think that a lot of people kind of just assume, oh, but it's on blockchain, so it is decent. No, it's not decentralized because it's on a blockchain. Uh, it's, it, you know, you can't just wish it to be decentralized. It's a very tough problem. So that's, you know, and then identity is, is also very challenging to, to create an identity that really is tied to your person and that is somehow digital. I mean, we've seen in India where they had this extremely large database, the Aadhaar system, and it was recently hacked. It was all based on biometrics. Um, so, so that's an issue. And in general, the problem with blockchains is that they're very, they're dumb databases. They're very dumb. They don't know anything about the world. And so you need a point of entry where you as an oracle are going to insert information from the world into the blockchain. And that is a huge problem. How do you do that reliably? And then, yeah, we, we will be talking about intermediaries there. Uh, so it's, it's really, you know, decentralization is expensive. So okay. you, you, can, you can only do it in a few areas. I okay, think. so what he was referring to in terms of the smart contract would be that if, if, if Rob and I made a bet on a game, we could set up a, uh, essentially um, a token transaction where there is no escrow agent and the token will transfer to his ledger if the Cowboys win or my ledger if the Cowboys lose or whatever the bet was and there's no need for, a, for kind of an intermediary to sort of hold. And that, that would be the, the most simplistic example if there's just a condition, a simple condition that gets met that you could actually create the, the blockchain result and the token would transfer and then the token would be redeemable. So that's an um, example. Barry, do you think the block, where do you think the blockchain is in the, in the evolution? Where do you think it goes? I think you can... Um anticipate my answer by now. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll bet you one, one Bitcoin that we won't be talking about it in the 10 big years. Bet. I think, um, I think that uh, the blockchain is a solution in search of a problem. I think the blockchain not only lacks a killer app, it lacks any useful app. I think any question you have about uh, encryption and security can be solved more efficiently at much lower cost. Hmm. Just talk to our friends at the NSA or the CIA about how to do encryption. Um, they can do it on a much more cost-benefit effective basis without uh, the blockchain. So uh, this is a bet that I may lose, but uh, you know, any potential example uh, of a blockchain-based transaction that you all can come up with. There are existing alternatives that work almost as well at a small fraction of the same cost and in principle can, can work better. What uh, about digital gold? What about... Uh, as a, sorry, as no. a, an application of blockchain technology. So gold is useful because it has 
ornamental value and because people think that it will hold that ornamental value over time. I can think of a, 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 a variety of other assets from the art that I might put on my wall that has ornamental value and may hold its value over time. Um, or the jewelry that you have in your safe deposit box. Okay. So I don't, I don't really see um, uh, a useful application here. I could be right. wrong. So to put this all in context a little bit, so there's lots of innovations, and you and I have spoken about leading up to this. This isn't the most significant of them. There's hundreds, thousands of others that are transforming everything we do, starting with the fact that a typical consumer has more computing power in the palm of his or her hand more computing power than a typical company did 15 years ago. Some of these applications will explode in ways we can't foresee. Some of them will die. Some of them, bits and pieces of them, will be taken. But the only thing I would observe in my job and also as a business person uh, for a long time is the rate at which the, uh, the industry and the world is learning how to take these different pieces and putting them into new and innovative in ways you can't predict is accelerating at a rate, it's certainly more than any time in our lifetime. And so, like all these things, you have to learn, you listen to pros and cons. You, and the most important thing I can say about, I don't know, but I think uh, the world is transforming in ways, and this is why it makes, if you run a business, which I did and you did, and we, is the first question you ask, what do we do that's distinctive? That question is getting tougher and tougher to answer, be, and, and it's easy to get commoditized right out of right. existence, sometimes overnight, and this, is, this whole debate is probably part of that overall trend, which is a little scary, and it also is gonna put tremendous pressure, which we can talk about later, on the education system and adaptability of the workforce, and it's gonna mean a lot to have a college education more and all those things which we can talk more, and it's causing more haves and have nots who can capitalize on it and put big pressure on our society. Okay, so, and, and we will talk about that, and I think that the, the haves and have nots is interesting because there's the technology haves and have nots, and we can sit here and talk about the NSA can do something, or, but there's lots of people in the world that are, that are starving for some consistency and some, and some sanctity in a transaction. So to say that we're gonna watch something is, in, is good because there's a lot of stuff going on right now in this world. So in, on the blockchain, um, there's a second currency. Bitcoin is just a single fun, fungible, a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin, like a dollar bill. And that was sort of a simplistic application of, of the blockchain. Another currency, another token emerged um, that's more open source and allows apps to be written on top of it called Ethereum. And the token was called an Ether. Or the, the, is that right? Ether was the token. And it allowed you to do something distinct. So I could have this Ether token represent this piece of art. And just like with a smart contract, I could transact the token. And the piece of art doesn't have to get in a car and drive it over. And it can transact a piece of land. So as an example, in late 2017, there was a very popular app written on Ethereum for collectibles and it was called Crypto Kitties. And it was essentially an online cat. And it was virtual pet adoption. Hmm. And you could give the cat had certain characteristics. And it became a collectible to a point where a single cat transacted in real dollars for $100,000, okay, a crypto asset. And the cat changed hands on the ledger, never physically changed hands. But what it did that was so significant, because unlike Bitcoin, where this coin looks like this coin, it allowed people to say that is a distinct thing. It's, it has a distinct signature, and it's unlike anything else. And so the question is, building on that, if there is sanctity in that transaction, then I could put my house, have my house be represented by a crypto token and transact the house, and the whole rigmarole around title insurance and whatnot would be, would be less necessary. Or we could transact in different countries, and that, that asset could move around, essentially, the ownership of it, just like this crypto kitty. So it was kind of, it was, they were all cryptographically separate and identifiable. So the question is, if that takes off, are we looking at a different way to transact real property? 
And Tour, what do you think about this? You've probably thought about this way more than I've read. Yeah, I'm a, I've been an Ethereum skeptic since 2014 um, in the sense that, um, well, first, like I said earlier, the, the, the base layer needs to be secure. And, and I think Ethereum right now is getting dangerously centralized in the sense that you know, they, they, will, they, will, they will become an inefficient version of a, of a centralized system. Like you know, PayPal is way more efficient than Ethereum. So that, that's one, one piece of skepticism. And then when it comes to the, the smart contracts, like these ideas have been around since the 80s, like doing smart contracts. Like a vending machine is a smart contract, for example, right? You, you put in the money and it automatically executes. You, you choose what you want and, and the food comes out or whatever, the drinks. Um, but, but so like I, like I said, the Oracle problem is, is a huge issue here. Like if you're talking about the crypto kitties, what if the startup behind those kitties goes bankrupt? And then the only thing we have in the blockchain, if the blockchain even it like continues to exist, is some kind of hash of something that existed once but now may have disappeared. Same with the house, right? If, if I want to do a real estate transaction on the blockchain, there, there has to be an entity that is trusted that will s store the, the, the vast amount of data that then the blockchain may be able to verify. So I think a blockchain is functional when it comes to proving the existence of something. There's a pretty limited application. So, so again, like I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about uh, blockchain having major contribution, at least in the short term. I think long term, there may, be, there may be really something there, especially when it comes to you know, um, validating information. Right. So, the, so um, mm -hmm. the, the things that, that people talk about is having your digital identity, which you talked about how hard that is. Um, and it's not just, it's reputation management. Uber knows what my rider rating is, but Marriott Hotels doesn't know my Uber rating if I want to get loyalty points. And if I could somehow control my yeah. digital I, reputational identity yeah. and store it in the blockchain and somehow have a token that represents that and transfer that token fungibly and offer that to who I want rather than Google doing it and collecting the economic rent for it or Facebook and selling me ads. I mean, so, so the, the, do you see that that, that that digital identity, that there's utility in that? People are so nervous about Facebook getting, you know, getting all the economic rent and Google so, and so Alibaba. Who, who verifies the information about your, your digital identity that you enter into your blockchain? Well, that's the question about is yeah, blockchain it's a good secure? question. Right. Um, I also think that if you're concerned about the security of, of the title to your house, there are better ways to verify that. I also think that there are better uses of society's resources than digital kitties. Would you say that if we lived in Central Africa and we were trying to transact? Pardon me? Would you say that if we lived in a, in a country where we didn't trust I, the, I think the... Central Africa has been revolutionized by the cell phone. That's uh, 20th century technology. Okay. Hmm. I think there is something there in the sense that you know, this digitization and commoditization of, of um, computation, right? Like you, you have this massive amount of computational power in, in your pocket. Um, I think there is something there where people want to be in charge more of their own identities. And so what I see in the future is more that banks are going, you will have custodians for keys. And so if I have a certain amount of private keys that are associated with various aspects of my identity, I can then decide this bank, I will store those parts of my identity. Another bank will store other things for me. And of course, if I wanted to, I could do it all myself, but that's, that's higher risk. So I think that there is really something there. And I think that it is a generational thing where, you know, I think I, there was recently in the news that a massive amount of young people um, is opting out of Facebook, right? And in, in part because of these privacy concerns. So I do think, um, yes, so, something like that is, is on the way, and, and I, I, I like the term unbundling, where something that was bundled before and centralized now, but I'm not sure if you need a blockchain for that. Okay, um, so we're going to leave blockchain in a minute, and I just want to give people a couple pieces of information that are kind of interesting, I find, um, that in 2018, earlier in 2018, the uh, Mobility Open Blockchain Initiative was launched that includes 80% of global auto manufacturers that are now developing a blockchain um, that tracks the digital identity of each car. And so it's a car passport essentially has a distinct blockchain that can track the, the, the vehicle's odometer and it can reduce fraud and purchases. Um, and it's got all the, leading, uh, all the leading auto manufacturers, GM, Ford, BMW, Renault, others. There's also an Ethereum blockchain um, 
that caught my attention uh, around digital advertising. Today, when we look at, when we look at ads on Facebook and, that, that, and Google that come our way, Google is collecting the rent, the economic rent for, for the, that ad being sent to us. Um, there's a, an app called the Brave Browser that's a ther built on the Ethereum that allows me uh, to capture uh, through attention points. The publisher can target me directly and the advertiser can sell ads to that publisher, whoever wrote the content. And then me as a viewer, can, the longer I stay on that article, the more tokens I earn. And, and, that, and then the more tokens I earn, the more attractive I get to that content provider to send me more of what I want. Hmm. And so you no longer need an ad blocker, and that's built on the, on the ledger, on the distributed ledger. Hmm. So there's a lot of very smart people working on this, way smarter than I am. Um, I'm just fascinated by it, and hopefully we've fascinated enough people here to, uh, to walk out and say, this is something that we need to keep our antenna up to. Um, also, let's talk, one, as, we, as we close here, we are in the age of disruption. And um, we'll start with Barry and we'll end with Rob. But as you look out, what excites you the most and what scares you the most in terms of the, you know, we've just talked about a couple um, of disruptive forces that are really challenging the way we think and do business and, and uh, conduct our lives. When you, when you, given all of your research, look out, um, what, what ex where, where are you most excited and also where are you most scared? Um, by the cluster of technologies we call artificial intelligence much more important than what we've uh, been speaking about previously. So I'm both excited and, and frightened by the potential. I'm frightened because they can be misused um, as well as used productively. I'm not terribly frightened by the prospect that they will put human beings out of work because I think artificial intelligence will only be viable in conjunction with human agency. Driverless cars still have to solve the trolley problem, right? You throw the one person in, in front of the trolley to save 10 others. We're still going to need the moral philosophers to do what the artificial intelligence can't. Um, in healthcare, we're still going to need people with uh, interpersonal skills. You're still going to need your pastor. Uh, he or she is not going to be put out of business by artificial intelligence, but where we fall down as a society clearly is in preparing people for that world. Okay. So what excites me most is, is really the, how technology is empowering individuals, like really the, the, the amount of individual sovereignty you can have. Like even if, if you're somebody in the middle class today, you have way more resources at your disposal than, than possibly a billionaire at the start of the last century. Um, uh, especially in terms of information. So that, that is incredibly exciting to me, how, how basically hackers are putting together little pieces that just allow individuals to have much more freedom to, to and, and, and I think that the invention of digital scarcity, scarcity fits into that, like for me uh, or for anybody really to have the option to, to um, um, have exposure to or, 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 or interact with uh, this global financial network uh, on, on just an individual basis, it's just incredible to me. I, I did not expect to see this coming. And then in terms of what am I most afraid of, this is kind of how I discovered Bitcoin, is um, you know living through the financial crisis and even kind of before that, seeing it coming to some extent in, uh, in Belgium where we had Fortis Bank uh, go, go bankrupt and, and uh, this, this very scary period of time um, is really, um, is really the, the debt situation of the world. Uh, I believe uh, the BIS put out a piece um, that showed that um, global debt was 200% uh, of GDP. 2007, now it's grown to 300% of GDP. Uh, you know, zero interest rates. Um, you know, these are things that, that I think are not sustainable. And so I, I, I am scared about how the transition is going to go because these things are not, you know, life ending. It's just, you know, you, you get, the, the debt gets wiped out somehow and then people start over. But that period where that shift happens, is it going to be stagflation? Um, uh, is it going to be high inflation, hyperinflation? Is it going to be a, a debt default of some sort? Like th that is scary, especially, you know, thinking about people who might not have the mobility to just live wherever they want. Okay. And Rob? So just I'll pick up where Barry uh, left off. Artificial intelligence, distributed computing power, the rate of disruption in, in, in global industry is uh, it's a rate we've never seen before. If you've got a college education or better, including some of the skills that Barry referred to, 
you'll, this may be painful, but you'll find a way to adapt to it because you've got the training and the skills and, and some of the higher skilled jobs are gonna uh, may even become more valuable. My concern is there are 46 million workers in this country with a high school education or less. And what they're increasingly finding with these trends are their jobs being disrupted, uh, restructured, or basically eliminated. And unless they have a skill or they get retrained, which is a lot easier to say than to do, they're finding their incomes during their careers are going from here to here. And there's a reason why there's a group in the country that feels the economy is working very well for them, and there's a sizable group that feels this economy is not. So I think it's very promising, as Barry said, artificial intelligence and a lot of these great tools we have. Our education system, though, has not caught up. And so we've been early childhood literacy, college readiness, skills training have got to be dramatically beefed up to keep up with the dramatic rate of change or we're gonna have a lot of challenges in, in our society. And I, I agree, and I, I would say that at, the, at its core is one of the things that, that uh, is happening globally, um, again, we're spoiled with this US-centric view, is that there has been a general mistrust of the way that central uh, governments and monetary authorities have been able to manage and, they, and these countries have turned over, whether you're in Venezuela or Zimbabwe or Argentina with their, with their um, once a decade financial crisis, um, the, the people are obviously yearning for a way to get around this trust problem. And as, and as Tour said, the, this generation that now has a tool called technology um, to devise a way is now, is now grasping. I don't, want to, I don't want to minimize what this is signaling and that, there's a, that there is a starvation for a big subset of people on this planet to try to find a way to, to interact peer to peer, to disintermediate, to deal with a way so they don't have to worry about being, being uh, somehow either manipulated or whatnot from, by the central authority. And they're equally distrustful of the technology oligarchs that have emerged in the Facebooks, Amazons, Googles, Alibaba, um, Baidu, and Tencent. And there's a hype element to it and, also, and which the fact it's perfect. investable as part of what's, and people have made a lot of money on the way perfect. up has oh, captured, right. that's and, part of this also. And, and, and that's what I want to end on because I think that that's what our goal tonight is to raise more questions than we answer um, and to think about things that are transformational that you'll say three years from now, oh yeah, I remember that, I remember that thing we, we talked about at the Bush Center. Now I'm seeing more of it, now I kind of understand it. Um, New Yorker Magazine, this week's issue, um, the October 22nd issue has a great article with a background. It's a very simple reason to read, read. It's called The Stuff Dreams Are Made Of. I want to remind folks that they can get Barry's book um, in the lobby and to remind people about November 13th, our Engage event um, with, uh, where Fox News' Harris Faulkner will uh, moderate a conversation with Admiral McRaven on military leadership. That event is sold out, but it'll be live streamed like this one on bushcenter.org. And if you're not already a member of the Bush Center, please join so that you'll get the up uh, you'll get the advance notice on great events like this. Thank you guys very much. This was a great Good topic. To Hopefully it was really interesting and I really enjoyed participating. Thank, Thank you. you. Great to talk to you, sir.